The year is 1992, and it's an exciting time for the Alien franchise. The first two films were already bona fide instant classics at this point. They were home video staples. And in 1992, new VHS releases of Alien and Aliens were in circulation. There was also a special double pack you could get at this time, which included the making of Alien 3, the newest entry in the series. 92 also saw the release of the Kenner Aliens line of action figures, a wide array of xenomorph monsters and action figure versions of our favorite characters from Aliens. The comic series was going strong. When it began three years prior, the first issues of Aliens were instant record-breaking hits for Dark Horse Comics. Responses to their storylines thus far, which included Outbreak, Nightmare Asylum, and Earth War, had been very positive. The comics were bold in that Dark Horse's approach wasn't to make tangential, one-off, alien-related stories, but actually continued from the movies as a sequel. In this series, Newt was the protagonist, all grown up and once again facing the aliens. The comics began in 1988, but by the time 1992 and Alien 3 came around, it seemed that unfortunately there were different plans for the character. This same year, Dark Horse Comics would go back to the story of Newt one last time with the release of Newt's Tale. This is a unique story that serves as both a prequel to Aliens, depicting events on the Acheron colony during the Xenomorph outbreak in its first half, and in its second half serving as an adaptation of Aliens based on James Cameron's screenplay for the film. For today's video, I wanted to take a closer look at this adaptation, written by Mike Richardson and penciled by Jim Somerville. How faithfully does it follow the film? What does it do differently? What can be found here that isn't in the actual movie? Like many adaptations of this kind, it includes differences such as changed or shortened dialogue, and yes, even some scenes that were left out of the film. Even though this comic was published six years after the release of the actual film, it does still seem to be the case here. This adaptation also contains scenes from the special edition version of the film, which first saw a release in 1990. While the special edition was available at this time, it wasn't as widely circulated at the time as the theatrical version, so a lot of these scenes were new to readers. There are also some moments that can only be found on the Aliens Deleted Scenes reel, which originally came included as a special feature on the Alien Anthology Blu-ray set, released in 2011. This is a collection of cut scenes that didn't make it into the theatrical or special edition versions of the film. The comic opens, taking place in the short window of events between Aliens and Alien 3. Somewhere in the endless expanse of space, a ship streaks towards its rendezvous with the planet Earth. Inside, a small passenger is sleeping, dreaming. Dreams that should bring tranquil peace, but instead replay a grisly nightmare. New to dreams of the planet Acheron and the colony of Hadley's Hope. While the first prequel half of this comic is mostly original, there is an adaptation of one of the special edition scenes in its first moments. This is when the Jordan family finds the derelict ship, though the dialogue is different than what we see in the final film. Look at this fat, juicy, magnetic profile, Russ exclaims. And it's mine. All mine. Half yours, dear, his wife, Anne, says. And half mine, too, says Newt. Russ laughs. I think I've got too many partners. Daddy, when are we going to go back to town? Just as soon as we're rich, honey. You always say that. I want to go back and play. Timmy cuts in. Yeah, you want to go back so you can cheat at playing Monster Maze. Well, we're not going to let you play anymore. I do not cheat. Do too. You go places we can't fit. That's why I'm the best. Oh yeah? Anne breaks them up. Knock it off, you two. If I catch either of you playing in those air ducts again, I'll tan your hides. A word from Russ in the front. Holy shit. Would you look at this? The tractor approaches the giant derelict ship, last seen by the crew of the Nostromo 57 years earlier. Folks, this time we have scored big, Russ says. Shouldn't we call this in? Let's wait until we know what to call it in as. How about Big Weird Thing? While this dialogue is different than what appeared in the film, it is actually directly adapted from James Cameron's screenplay. To date, there's no footage of this dialogue available in any version of the film or in additional deleted scenes. Either it was never filmed in the first place, or it was filmed and cut very early on. Either way, I'd imagine the reason would be the same, most likely for pacing. 
This same dialogue would appear in another form, however, in the novel Alien River of Pain, which also details the fall of Hadley's Hope. Russ and Anne leave their children in the tractor and go to investigate the ship. Several hours pass, and Timmy has fallen asleep. Newt shakes him awake. Timmy, wake up. They've been gone a long time. It'll be okay. Dad knows what he's doing. I'm scared. I had this... This dream. It was real weird. Knock it off, Newt. You can't scare me. This is a moment exclusive to the Newt's Tale comic. It's not from the script or anywhere else. In the comic series, Newt's dreams always played an important part in the story. She struggled with determining what was real and what was a horrible nightmare. And it all emphasized a morbid connection she had with the alien. This line could be a nod to that aspect of the character in the comics. Anne comes back to the tractor in a panic, calling for help on the radio. As described in the script, as Anne shouts the mayday, Newt looks past her, to the ground. Russ Jordan lies there inert, dragged somehow by Anne from inside the ship. There is something on his face. An appalling, multi-legged creature, pulsing with obscene life. Newt begins to scream hysterically, competing with the shrieking wind, which rises to crescendo. At this point in the film, the action would cut back to Ripley, but this prequel comic explores the events that directly follow. Russ is brought back into town, and soon an alien bursts from his chest. Other colonists investigate the ship and bring back more parasites. The outbreak is swift as more colonists are taken for hosts, and a final stand is made in the blockaded storage facility. Newt, alone, is able to escape into the air ducts once the aliens take over. Days pass, and Newt survives undetected. It's at this point where the story transforms into an adaptation. Newt hears the voices of the rescue team and is soon discovered. As she hides, Ripley calls out to her. Come on out. It's all right. Hicks grabs her. She bites him and makes a run for it. Ow. Shit. Watch it. She bites. Drake responds. Let her go, man. Who cares? While neither Hicks or Drake have lines here in either version of the film, this exchange is from the script. Drake's line ended up being filmed and can be found in the Aliens Deleted Scenes reel. Let her go, man. Who cares? As per the Aliens script, just ahead Ripley sees Newt enter a dark space and slam a steel hatch. Ripley pushes the hatch open before the child can latch it and crawls in after her. Newt is backed into a cul-de-sac in the tiny steel chamber. Ripley shines her light around in amazement. It is a nest. A nest built by a child. Newt edges along the far wall and dives for the hatch. Ripley grabs her, controlling her in a bear hug. The kid struggles wildly, like a cat at the vets. Eyes wide, hands lashing out in a frenzy, but silent. No scream. It's okay. You're safe. Newt goes limp, almost catatonic. Her lips are white and trembling. Her eyes track wildly, and she flinches from unseen terrors. We read a dark nightmare world in her eyes. Ripley's light falls on something amidst the debris. A framed photograph of Newt, dressed up and smiling. A ribbon in her hair. In embossed gold letters underneath it says, First Grade Citizenship Award, Rebecca Jordan. In the manager's center in operations, Lieutenant Gorman asks for the girl's name. Ripley hands Dietrich the Citizenship Award. Rebecca. Gorman tries to get information out of Newt with little success. Where are your parents? Concentrate. Give it a rest, Gorman. He leaves along with Dietrich and Burke. Total brain lock. Come on, we're wasting our time. You don't say much, do you? Ripley says to the child as she begins to wipe her face clean. You're a brave kid, Rebecca. N Newt. Nobody calls me Rebecca, except my brother Timmy. All right, Newt, I'm Ripley. She gestures to her disembodied doll. Who's this? Does she have a name? Casey. Where is your brother? Timmy's his name? And what about your mom and dad? Dead. They're all dead. Can I go now? Don't you think you'd be safer here with us? Those people are here to protect you. They're soldiers. It won't make any difference. Hicks enters. We're moving out. We found bio-readings over at the processing station. 
Looks like there might be some settlers alive over there. Newt begins to try to take off again. She's running. Grab her. Hicks grabs her, and again she bites at him. He takes his arm back. Hope the kid don't have rabies. Ripley takes Newt by the hand. Come on. Here, the comic omits the moments with Hudson tracking down the PDTs and instead replaces it with quick, expository dialogue from Hicks. What follows, though, is another deleted scene. Newt once again tries to escape and once again bites Hicks. This! Ah! Newt! No! Hope she ain't got rabies. The APC makes its way to the processor and there's some new dialogue from Hudson and Drake. This isn't what I had in mind when I joined the Marines. Be all you can be my ass. That's the army, asshole. We're the few, the proud, the dog meat. This is not in the script. The Marines make their way inside. Gorman radios in. You want sublevel two, next one down, then proceed on a one two five. Got it. They approach the hive and Gorman struggles to see it on video. We're not making that picture out too well. What is it? From the script. They enter the organic labyrinth, playing their lights over the walls revealing a biomechanical lattice, like the marrow of some vast bone. The air is thick with steam, trickling water. The place seems almost alive. You tell me, man. I only work here. Proceed inside. Close on video as it pans slowly, revealing a base relief of detritus from the colony. Furniture, wiring, human bones, skulls, fused together with a translucent, epoxy-like substance. Looks like some sort of secreted resin, Dietrich says. A new line from Hudson, not in the script. Looks like my ex-mother-in-law's kitchen. Ripley watches the monitor in horror. Oh, God. They've been busy little creatures, haven't they? Burke says. Ripley turns to Newt. Newt, go up front. Now. She turns back to the monitors and to Gorman. Lieutenant, what do those pulse rifles fire? 10 millimeter explosive tip caseless, the standard light armor piercing round. Why? Look at where your team is. That structure is a big fusion reactor. If they fire their weapons in there, they'll rupture the cooling system. So what? Burke intervenes. We're talking thermonuclear explosion. Adios, muchachos. Oh, great. Wonderful. Shit. He radios to the Marines. Look, we can't have any firing there. Flame units only. I want rifles slung and no grenades. Is he crazy? Hudson says, and is heard by Gorman over the radio. Apone moves in on the group. I want the magazines from all rifles. I want all rifles slung. What are we supposed to use, man? Harsh language? Flamethrowers only. Do it now. The harsh language line from Hudson here was said by Frost in the final film. As originally scripted, however, this was meant to be Hudson's line. Apone walks among the troopers, collecting the magazines from each one's weapon. Vasquez turns hers over reluctantly. When Apone moves on, Vasquez slips a spare magazine from concealment and inserts it in her weapon. Drake does the same. Hicks hangs back in the shadows. He opens a cylindrical sheath attached to his battle harness. Slides out an old-style pump 12-gauge with a sawed-off buttstock. Chambers around. I always keep this handy. For close encounters. Here is another line that was a little bit different in the script from what we saw in the movie. In the final film, Hicks's line is... I'd like to keep this handy. For close encounters. A slight difference, sure, but I definitely prefer the version of the line that we got. Apone stops, his expression changing. They face a wall of living horror. The colonists have been brought here and entombed alive. Cocoons protrude from the niches and interstices of the structure. The cocoon material is the same translucent epoxy. The bodies are frozen in carelessly twisted positions. Macabre image from frozen agony. Many are dissociated, skeletal. Rib cages burst outward, as if exploded from within. Paralyzed, brought here. Entombed in living death as hosts for the embryos growing within them. Dietrich moves close to examine one of the figures, perhaps the most recent. A woman, ghost white and drained. The woman's eyes snap open. They seem to plead. 
Please. God. Kill me. Ripley's reaction inside the APC is not shown in this comic adaptation. The woman begins to convulse and scream until the alien bursts from her chest, hissing wildly. A pwn orders to torch it, and the creature is engulfed in flames. Gorman calls out. A pwn, what's going on? Hudson alerts to the activity on his tracker. I got readings in front and behind. Look sharp, people. Go in for red. Ripley urges Gorman to pull the team out as he asks again what's going on. Vasquez fires her smart gun. Let's rock. Get them out of there, Ripley urges further. Shut up. Just shut up. Uh, a pwn. Who's firing? I ordered a hold fire. The aliens move into attack, and this comic version doesn't go into too many specifics. Things such as Dietrich's attack, Frost getting killed, and much more of the frantic yelling between marines is absent here. Instead, we have a panel giving a general idea of the panic and chaos ensuing, and we can see Apone just as he's about to be snatched up. Apone! Apone! Uh, fall back! Hudson squawks in on the radio. The Sarge is gone! They're cut off. Do something, Ripley demands as she makes her way to the driver's seat. Newt, sit down and put your seatbelt on. As described in the screenplay, Ripley jumps into the driver's seat of the APC, takes a deep breath, starts slapping switches. Ripley, what the hell? She slams the tractor into gear. As the drive wheels spin on the wet ground, the massive machine leaps forward. Ripley sees smoke pouring out of the complex ahead as she slides sideways onto the descending rampway. She slams the left and right drive wheel actuators viciously, spinning the machine into a roaring pivot. Gorman lunges forward along the aisle, abandoning his command center. What are you doing? Turn around. That's an order. He claws at her, hysterical. Burke pulls him off. The APC roars down into the smoky structure, tearing away outcroppings of the alien encrustation. Ripley hits the floodlights, strobe beacon, siren. She homes on the flash of weapons fire ahead. The APC crashes inside, showering debris. Hicks, supporting a limping Hudson, appears out of the smoke. The APC pulls up broadside and Burke gets the crew door open. Drake and Vasquez back out of the dense mist, firing as they fall back. Drake goes empty, slams the buckles cutting loose his smart gun harness, and unslings a flamethrower. Hicks pushes Hudson inside, leaps in after him, and drags Vasquez inside, massive gear and all. She sees a dark shape lunge toward Drake. She fires one burst, prone, clean body hits. The flash lights up the hideous inhuman grin, blowing open the thing's thorax. A spray of bright yellow acid slashes across Drake's face and chest, eating into him like a hot knife through butter. Hicks is rolling the door closed when Vasquez lunges, clawing out the opening. He stops her, dragging her inside. He's down! Drake is down! Hicks screams right in her face. He's gone! Forget it, he's gone! As an alien tries to make its way into the APC, the comic follows the action pretty closely. Hicks takes out his shotgun. He blasts it right in the creature's face, the acid blood sprays, and Hudson's arm is terribly burned. It does not contain Hicks's line, Eat this, however. This line was also not in the screenplay. As Ripley makes her escape with the APC, emerging from the debris, she speeds through the complex and Lieutenant Gorman, in the back, is knocked unconscious. Then an alien attacks. From the screenplay. Suddenly an alien arm arcs down, right in front of Ripley's face. It smashes the windshield. Glistening, hideous jaws lunge inside. Ripley recoils. Face to face once again with the same mind-numbing horror. She reacts instinctively. Slams both sets of brakes with all their strength. The huge wheels lock. The creature flips off, landing in the headlights. Ripley hits full throttle. The APC roars forward, smashing over the abomination. Its skeletal body is crushed under the massive wheels. It rolls, tumbling, lost in the darkness behind as the machine thunders onto the causeway and away from the station. The tractor limps to a halt, a half kilometer from the atmosphere processing station. The APC is a smoking, acid-scarred mess. Ripley asks Snoot if she's okay. She gives a reassuring thumbs up. Hicks checks on Gorman. Gorman's alive, looks like a concussion. Vasquez grabs the unconscious lieutenant furious. You're dead. Wake up, Pendejo. I'm gonna kill you. Hicks holds her back. Hold it. Back off. Right now. 
Hudson notices the readouts on some of the Marines left behind. Hey, look at the readouts. Respesky and Dietrich ain't dead, man. Their signs are real low, but they ain't dead. Well, I guess we better just go back and get them, says Vesquez. You can't help them. Right now they're being cocooned, just like those colonists. Oh shit, this ain't happening. All right, let's nerve gas the whole nest. No good. We don't know if it'll affect them. I say we take off and nuke the entire site from orbit. It's the only way to be sure. Burke steps in. Whoa, hold on just a second. I know this is an emotional moment, but let's not make snap judgments here. This is clearly an important species we're dealing with. We can't arbitrarily exterminate them. Wrong. I believe this operation is under military jurisdiction, and Hicks is next in the chain of command. Look, this is a multi-million dollar installation. He can't make that kind of decision. He's just a grunt. No offense. None taken. Hicks then radios into Pharaoh. Prep the dropship for dust-off. We're gonna need immediate evac. I think we'll take off and nuke the site from orbit. It's the only way to be sure. At this point in the comic, the final moments of Spunkmeyer and Pharaoh at the dropship are omitted. Instead, we see the group of survivors on the ground as they notice something is wrong. This leads to a new moment with Newt, not in the script, where she has a strong feeling of what's behind the crash. It's them. They're on this ship. They'll never let us go. From the screenplay. They watch in dismay as the approaching ship dips and veers wildly. Its main engines roar full on and the craft accelerates toward them even as it loses altitude. It skims the ground, clips a rock formation. The ship slews, sideslipping. It hits a ridge, tumbles, bursting into flame, breaking up. Run! Ripley grabs Newt and sprints for cover as a tumbling section of the ship's massive engine module slams into the APC and it explodes into twisted wreckage. The dropship skips again like a stone engulfed in flames and crashes into the station. A tremendous fireball. The remainder of the ground team watches their hopes of getting off the planet and most of their superior firepower reduced to flaming debris. Well, that's great. That's just great. What are we supposed to do, man? Are you finished? I guess we're not leaving, right? I'm sorry, Newt. You don't have to be sorry. It wasn't your fault. It was them. Just tell me what we're gonna do now. What are we gonna do? I'm sad to say that Hudson's line, Game Over Man, is not featured in this comic. A terrible omission, in my opinion. It should have had a full-page panel, but it was not in the script and not adapted here. Newt, however, does deliver her famous line. We should get back because it'll be dark soon, and they mostly come at night. Mostly. They head back, and Hicks overviews the remaining weaponry. This is all we could salvage. We got four pulse rifles with about 50 rounds each. That ain't good. About 15 M40 grenades and one flamethrower less than half full, one damaged. How long after we're declared overdue can we expect a rescue? Ripley asks. About 17 days, Hicks answers. Hudson expresses his shock. We're not going to make it 17 hours. Those things are going to come in here just like they did before, man. They're going to come in here and get us, long before... Ripley cuts him off and points towards Newt. She survived longer than that with no weapons and no training. Newt gives Hudson a salute. You better just start dealing with it, Hudson, because we need you, and I'm tired of your bullshit. Now get on a terminal and call up the floor plan file. Construction, blueprints, I don't care. Anything that shows the layout here. I affirmative. I'm on it. The scenes of planning and barricading are significantly shortened and altered, highlighting the main points. They view the blueprints and consider their options. The service tunnel between the processing station and the sublevel here is how they're moving back and forth. Yeah, we got a figure on them getting into the complex. All right, the first thing we do is put an armed remote sentry at this end. We repair the barricades at these intersections and weld plate steel over these ducts. They can only come at us from these two corridors, so we put the other two sentries here. And it's at this point that Hicks gives Ripley the locator. Here, put this on. I can find you anywhere in the complex with this. 
Just a precaution, you know? Thanks. Ripley takes note. Come on, honey. Let's go find a place to lie down. From the screenplay, Ripley carries an exhausted Newt through the interconnecting rooms of the medical wing. She reaches an operating room, which is small but very high-tech. Vault-like metal walls, strange equipment, several metal cots have been set up, displacing OR equipment, which is pushed into one corner. Newt is resting her head on Ripley's shoulder, barely awake, out of steam. Ripley sets her on one of the cots, and Newt lies down. Now you just lie here and have a nap. You're exhausted. I don't want to. I have scary dreams. I'll bet Casey doesn't have bad dreams. Ripley, she doesn't have bad dreams because she's made of plastic. Oh, sorry, Newt. My mommy always said there were no monsters, no real ones, but there are. Why do they tell kids that? Well, some kids can't handle it like you. Ripley straps the locator on Newt's wrist. Pierre, this is for luck. Ripley goes to get up and Newt grabs her. Don't go. Please. I'll be right in the next room. I won't leave you, honey. I mean it. That's a promise. You promise? Cross my heart. And hope to die? And hope to die. Newt gets up and hugs her tightly. Now go to sleep. And don't dream. Notably, Ripley's response to Newt's line, my mommy said there were no monsters, no real ones, but there are, is different here. In the film, her response is, Most of the time it's true. But here, and in Cameron's original script, the line is, Well, some kids can't handle it like you. In the med lab, Ripley discusses the nature of the aliens with the others. Okay, now let me get this straight. They grabbed the colonists, took them over to the AP station, and immobilized them to be hosts for more of those. Which would mean lots of those parasites, right? Each person. Over a hundred, at least. Plus livestock, Bishop adds. This is a different line than what was scripted or in the film. An interesting suggestion from Bishop that the livestock could be hosts as well. But each one of those things comes from an egg, right? So who lays the eggs? Hudson offers his opinion. Hey, maybe it's like an ant hive. There's like one female that runs this show. You know, the queen. The mama. She's badass, man. Big. I want those specimens destroyed as soon as you're through. You understand? Mr. Burke gave instructions that they're to be kept alive for return to the company lab. He was very specific. The scene that follows is a little different from the film version. In the final film, this scene cuts directly to Ripley and Burke mid-conversation. However, here, and originally scripted, there is an opening to this scene that was left out. Burke, you son of a bitch. What do you think you're doing telling Bishop we're bringing those things back with us? Look, Ripley, this thing is major. Those specimens are worth millions to the bioweapons division. If you're smart, we can both come out of this heroes. Set up for life. You'll never get a dangerous organism past ICC quarantine. They can't impound it if they don't know about it. But they will know about it, Burke. From me. Just like they'll know you were responsible for the deaths of 157 colonists here. I just checked the colony log. You sent the colonists out there. Your directive was received 61279. You knew about those things, and you sent them out to that ship anyway. You can't prove any of that. It was a bad call. That's all. Bad call? You wanted exclusive rights to those creatures, didn't you? That's why you came along this mission. Do you have any idea what you've done here? Well, I'm gonna see they nail your hide to the wall, kiddo. I expected more of you, Ripley. I thought you'd be smarter than this. Happy to disappoint you. Ripley is walking toward operations when a strident alarm begins to sound. She breaks into a run. Ripley double times it to Hicks's tactical console where Hudson and Vasquez have already gathered. Hicks slaps a switch, killing the alarm. They're coming. They're in the tunnel. The robot guns are kicking in, tracking and firing at multiple targets. They must be wall to wall. It's a shooting gallery in there. The RSS guns pound away, echoing through the complex. Their separate bursts overlap in an irregular rhythm. The digital counter on B gun reads zero. Silence. Then a gong like booming echoes eerily up from sublevel. They're at the pressure door. The booming increases in volume and ferocity. 
mixed with the echoing crash clang and a nerve-wrecking screech of claws on steel. The intercom buzzes, startling them. Bishop here. I'm afraid I have some bad news. Everyone including Bishop is crowded at the window, intently watching the AP station, which is a dim silhouette in the mist. The cooling tanks must have been damaged during your visit. See that? Emergency venting. How long till it blows? Four hours. The blast radius will be about 30 kilometers, about equal to 20 megatons. I don't believe this. Do you believe this? Why can't we shut it down from here? I'm sorry, there's been too much damage. Overload is inevitable at this point. We need the other ship from the Sulaco. Can we bring it down on remote somehow? How? The transmitter was on the APC. It's wasted. There's got to be a way. What about the colony transmitter? No, I checked. The hard wiring between here and there was damaged. We can't align the dish. Well, then somebody's just going to have to go out there with a portable terminal, patch in manually, and bring it down here. Oh, right. With those things out there? No way. I'll go. I'm the only one qualified to remote pilot the ship anyway. Yeah, right. Bishop should go. Good idea. Believe me, I'd prefer not to. I may be synthetic, but I'm not stupid. All right, let's get on it. What'll you need? An instant later comes the high-pitched trilling of a motion sensor alarm. Hicks looks at the tactical board. Well, the creatures are in the complex. This last moment is not in the final film. As originally conceived, all throughout the scenes we would be able to hear the thumping of the aliens making their way into the complex until finally it stops and the realization that they've made it through dawns on the survivors. This scene was filmed and can be found within the deleted scenes reel. Let's get on with it. What do you know? Listen. Stop. They're in the complex. Bishop prepares for his journey into the tunnel. How long? Ripley asks. The duct runs almost to the uplink assembly. 180 meters, say 40 miles to crawl down there. One hour to patch in and align the antenna, 30 minutes to prep the ship, then about 50 minutes flight time. It's going to be close. Bishop is sealed into the duct and makes his way through. See you soon. Ripley and the others gather around the sentry gun readouts. They're in the approach corridors. No, they've retreated. The guns stopped them, Hicks says. Yeah, but look. No ammo. Next time they can walk right up and knock. Hicks turns to Hudson and Vasquez. I want you two walking the perimeter. I know we're all strung out, but stay frosty and alert. We've got to stop any entries before they get out of hand. As they leave, he makes his way to Ripley. How long since you slept? 24 hours? They'll get us, Hicks. I'm not going to end up like the others. If it comes to that, I'll do us both. This scene is different and shortened than what appeared in the final film, but does contain a line not present in any version. Ripley's line, they'll get us, only appears in the deleted scenes. They'll get us. Maybe. Maybe not. The comic also omits the moment of Hicks training Ripley with a pulse rifle, as well as Ripley discovering Gorman has awakened, and instead has Ripley leave to go get some rest, then things go unexpectedly. From the screenplay. Entering the darkened chamber, Ripley looks around. Newt is nowhere to be seen. On a hunch, she kneels down and peers under the bed. Newt is curled up there, jammed as far back as she can get, fast asleep, still clutching Casey. Ripley stares at Newt's tiny face, so angelic despite the demons that have chased her through her dreams and the reality between dreams. Without waking the little girl, she slips her arms around her. She gently disengages herself from Newt and is about to crawl out from beneath the cot when she sees something and freezes. Across the room just inside the door to the med lab are two innocuous but nonetheless chilling objects. Two stasis cylinders. Their tops are hinged open and the suspension fields are switched off. They are both empty. Ripley feels a slow upwelling wave of terror rise through her in that silent frozen moment. The inescapable certainty of a lethal presence. Unable to move or breathe, she looks around frantically, assessing the situation. Newt. Newt, wake up. What? Where are... Shh. Don't move. We're in trouble. They listen in the darkness for the slightest betrayal of movement. 
The scrabble of multiple legs across the polished floor, for example. There is only the droning hum of the little space heater. Ripley reaches up and, clutching the springs of the underside of the cot, begins to inch it away from the wall. She snaps her head around. A scuttling shape leaps toward her from the foot of the bed. She ducks with a startled cry. The obscene thing hits the wall above her, legs moving lightning fast. Reflexively, she slams the bed against the wall, pinning the creature inches above her face. Its legs and tail writhe with incredible ferocity, and it emits a demented, piercing squeal. Ripley heaves Newt across the polished floor, and in a frenzied scramble rolls from beneath the cot. She flips it over, trapping the creature underneath. Ripley hugs Newt close and heads toward the door, moving as if every object in the room had a million volts running through it. She reaches the door, hits the wall switch. Nothing happens. Disabled from outside. Ripley picks up a steel chair and slams it against the observation window. It bounces back from the high-impact material. She tries again. Ripley turns, studying the room. No good. She removes her lighter from a jacket pocket and picks up some papers from the counter. Moving cautiously, she boosts Newt up onto the surgical table in the center of the room and clambers up after her. Ripley, I'm scared. I know, honey. Me too. Ripley lights the papers and holds the flaming mass under the temperature sensor of a fire control system sprinkler head. It triggers, spraying the room from several sources with water. An alarm sounds throughout the complex. Ripley and Newt are drenched as the sprinklers continue to drizzle in the darkness. The siren hoots maniacally, masking all of their sound. Ripley scans the room with her lights, her hair plastered to her face, wiping water out of her eyes. Something leaps at her face. She screams and topples off the table, splashing to the floor. In a blur of multi-jointed legs, the creature scuttles up her body. She tears at it, but it is incredibly powerful for its size. It moves like lightning toward her head, avoiding her fumbling hands. Newt screams abjectly, backing away until she is pressed up against a desk in one corner. Ripley has both hands up, forcing the pulsing body back from her face. The thing's tail whips around her throat and begins to tighten, forcing the underside of its body close to her. Ripley thrashes about, knocking over equipment, sending instruments clattering. Angle on Newt as crab-like legs appear from behind the desk, right behind her. She sees it and, thinking fast, jams the desk against the wall, pinning the writhing thing. The legs of the chittering thing clawed Ripley's head, getting a sure grip even as she whips her head from side to side. A figure appears at the observation window, a silhouette behind the misted over glass. Hicks's eyes appear. He steps back. Wham! A burst of pulse rifle fire shatters the tempered glass. Hicks dives into the crazed spiderweb pattern and explodes into the room in a shower of fragments. He hits rolling, his armor grinding through the shards and slides across to Ripley. He gets his finger around the thrashing legs of the vicious beast and pulls. Hudson leaps into the room, flings Newt away from the desk to go skidding across the wet floor and blasts the second creature against the wall, point blank, acid and smoke. Gorman appears at Ripley's side and grabs the tail, unwinding its writhing length like a boa constrictor coil from her throat. All of them grip the struggling, shrieking creature. Hicks hurls the thing into the corner. It scrabbles upright and in an instant leaps back toward them. Wham! Hudson gets it clean. Ripley collapses, gagging. Burke. It was Burke. An interesting small change in this scene. It's Hudson that shoots the second facehugger, while in the movie, it's Vasquez. Since this follows Cameron's script, though, Hudson was originally written as having nailed two for two. Burke is interrogated in operations, and he denies his involvement. I don't get it. It doesn't make any sense. Ripley outlines his plan. He figured he could get an alien back through quarantine if Newt or I were impregnated. We'd be frozen for the trip back and nobody would know about the embryos we were carrying. He'd sabotage certain freezers on the ship, jettison the bodies, and make up any story he wanted. Hudson leans in threateningly. He's dog meat. The lights go out. They cut the power. They're inside the complex. They found a way in. Signals clean. Range 20 meters. 12 meters. Man, this is a big friggin' signal. 10 meters. Nine meters. Eight. Can't be. That's inside this room. It's read and write. Look. Six meters. Five. What the? From the screenplay. He looks at Ripley. It dawns on them both at the same time. She feels a cold, premonitory dread as she angles her tracker upward to the ceiling, almost overhead. The tone gets louder. 
Hicks climbs onto a file cabinet and raises a panel of acoustic drop ceiling. He shines his light inside. A soul-wrenching nightmare image. Moving in the beam of light are aliens. Lots of aliens. They are crawling like bats, upside down, clinging to the pipes and beams of the structural ceiling, not touching the flimsy acoustic panels. Hicks falls into the room just as the creatures detach en masse from the handholds. The ceiling explodes, raining debris. Nightmare shapes drop into the room. Newt screams. Hudson opens fire. Much like with the attack in the hive earlier, not every detail of the sequence is shown, but we get a general sense of the action taking place. A curious standout most definitely would be the use of flamethrowers. Both Vasquez and Gorman are seen fending off the alien attack with flame units here. This is not in the final film. Burke makes a run for it, locking himself into the med lab as Ripley calls him to stop. As he closes and locks the door, we see that there are two aliens waiting for him inside. His fate in this moment is only implied by this panel, and not shown as in the film. Burke, open the door, Ripley shouts. From the screenplay. Behind her, an alien is moving down the corridor like a locomotive, a graceful skeleton shape as lethal and inhuman as you can imagine. Strobe flashes backlight the demented silhouette. Shaking, Ripley raises her rifle. She squeezes the trigger. A flashbulb glimpse of shrieking jaws as the silhouette is hurled back, screeching insanely. Ripley is slammed against the door by the recoil, blinded by the flash and deafened by the concussion. Hudson screams as floor panels lift under him, and clawed arms sees him lightning fast, dragging him down. Another skeletal shape leaps on him from above. He disappears into the subfloor crawlway. Hicks, Vasquez, and Gorman make it to the medlab access corridor. Newt grabs Ripley by the hand and tugs her across the room. Come on, this way. She leads Ripley to an air vent set low on the wall and expertly unlatches the grill, swinging it open. Newt starts inside, but Ripley pulls her back. Stay behind me. Ripley trades her rifle for Gorman's flamethrower before he can protest and enters the air shaft, which is a tight fit. Newt scrambles in behind, followed by Hicks, Gorman, and Vasquez on rear guard. Glancing back fearfully, Newt pushes on Ripley's butt as they crawl rapidly through the shaft. Hicks calls into his headset. Bishop, this is Hicks. You read me? Come in. Over. I read you. The ship is on its way. ETA, 16 minutes. All right, stand by. We're on our way. Ripley turns into a larger main duct where there is enough room to crab walk in a low crouch. She runs, scraping her back on the ceiling. The trooper's armor clatters in the confined space. They approach an intersection. Do you know the way to the landing field? Sure. Go left. The beam of Ripley's light wavers hypnotically in the tunnel ahead. She blinks, seeing something. Not sure. A glinting, obscene form moving toward them, filling the tunnel at the absolute limit of the light's power. Go back. Go back. They try to crawl back, jamming together. Behind them, the way they have come, a grating is battered with a ferocious clang, and the deadly silhouette of a warrior flows into the duct. They are trapped. Hicks snaps out his hand welder and cuts into the wall of the duct. Molten metal spatters him as sparks fill the tunnel with lurid light. Beyond is a narrow service way, lined with pipes and conduit. Hicks slides through the searing hole, lifting Newt safely through as Ripley hands her out. Vasquez, fall back. Her rifle goes dry. She draws her service pistol. Suddenly she looks up as a warrior screeches down from a vertical shaft right above her. She fires with incredible rapidity. Bam! 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 Rolls aside. She fires again, emptying the pistol, kicking the thrashing shape away. Acid cuts through her chicken plate armor, searing into her thigh. She cries out, gritting her teeth against the white-hot pain. Gorman sees Vasquez hit, unable to move, sees the creatures coming the other way, and turns away from the escape hole. Vasquez sees him, barely conscious. Leave me. No can do. She seizes his hand in a deadly grip, but we recognize it as the power greeting she shared with Drake, something for the chosen few. Gorman returns the grip. You always were an asshole, Gorman. Give me a couple of them grenades. He hands her two grenades and arms two himself as the creatures are upon them, rushing with Ripley, Newton, Hicks as a full tilt run. The service way lights up with a powerful blast behind them, and they stumble with a shockwave. Newt breaks out ahead, and it's all Ripley and Hicks can do to keep up. An interesting difference here, it isn't the blast that knocks Newt back into the rotor in the comic or scripted version. 
On their way to the shortcut across the roof, Newt is trying to make her way through and take Ripley by the hand, but she simply slips and falls. As per the script, Newt slips, a rusted rib collapsing under her foot. She slides, catches herself with one hand. Ripley reaches for her, dropping her light. Ripley strains, reaching, her hand groping for Newt's. They miss, inches apart. She slips. Hicks lunges, grabbing her oversized jacket, and she slips out of it. With an echoing scream, Newt plummets, sliding down the chute into darkness. Newt is in a low grotto-like chamber filled with pipes and machines. It is flooded, almost up to Newt's waist. She looks up, seeing light streaming through a grating. Ripley's voice seems to come from there. Newt, stay right where you are. Don't move. Mommy? Newt, can you hear me? Here. I'm here. I'm here. Climb down, honey. We have to cut through. Newt backs away, climbing down the pipe as Hicks cuts into the bars with his hand torch. Newt, standing waist-deep in the water, watches sparks shower blindingly as Hicks cuts. She bites her lip, trembling, cold and terrified. Silently, a glistening shape rises in one graceful motion from the water behind her. It stands, dripping, dwarfing her tiny form. Newt turns, sensing the movement. She screams as the shadow engulfs her. The comic omits Ripley's trip back to the atmosphere processor and cuts directly to Newt waking up in the hive. Then comes a moment not scripted and only found within this story. Newt opens her eyes and sees all the cocoon dead bodies around her. I've had my suspicions in the past that she may have also seen her mother here, but it could just be one of the many colonists. From the screenplay, Newt is cocooned in a pillar-like structure at the edge of a cluster of upright, ovoid shapes, alien eggs. Her eyelids flutter open and she becomes aware of her surroundings. The egg nearest to her begins to move opening like an obscene flower at its top to reveal something stirring within. Newt stares, transfixed by terror, as the jointed legs appear over the lip of the ovoid one by one. She screams. Newt watches the facehugger emerge and turn toward her. Ripley runs in just as it is tensing to leap and fires, blasting it with a burst from the assault rifle. The flash illuminates the figure of an adult warrior nearby. It spins, moving straight for Ripley. She unleashes the flamethrower, and it vanishes into a fireball. Ripley runs to Newt and begins tearing at the fresh, resinous cocoon material, freeing the child. She swings her up onto her back. I knew you'd come. I promised I wouldn't leave you. And I want you to hold on real tight, okay? It is at this moment that one of the most talked about deleted scenes occurs. A hand comes from the wall, grabbing Ripley. It's Burke, cocooned and impregnated. Help me. I can feel it inside. Oh God, it's moving. I can't help you, Burke. Not now. But you can still help yourself. She hands him a grenade. No, Ripley, I can't do it. She turns away, hearing the thundering noises of the reactor shaking throughout the area as Burke calls for her to come back. The alarm voice announces you now have 13 minutes to reach minimum safe distance. A piercing shriek fills the chamber. Ripley turns and sees the massive creature that has been laying these eggs, the alien queen. Recognizing the intruders, the queen lets out another piercing hiss. Drones begin to surround Ripley and Newt. Ripley aims her flamethrower and torches the surrounding eggs as the queen screeches in agony. Once more, as a notable action set piece in the film, the comic can't possibly replicate every frame, but again we get a general sense of what's going on as Ripley blasts her way out of the hive. As in the film, Ripley makes her way along with Newt to the elevators while the Queen breaks free from the Hive and follows them. A difference here that was originally scripted is that Ripley escapes with Newt on the ladder, then up the stairs to reach the platform to meet Bishop. Realizing they may be at the end, Ripley tells Newt to close her eyes. The elevator comes up, revealing a large, dark silhouette that belongs to the alien Queen. The dropship then appears behind them. Bishop, you made it! The alarm voice announces, you now have 30 seconds to reach minimum safe distance. Ripley and Newt board the ship and escape the Queen charging behind them. The dropship speeds off and the site is nuked. The survivors ascend into the Sulaco's cargo dock. Tears stream down Newt's face. Ripley strokes her hair. It's okay, baby. We made it. Newt sees Hicks bandaged and unconscious, and because his earlier scene was left out of this comic, Ripley provides some brief exposition. 
Don't worry, Newt. He was hurt by one of the creatures, but he's going to be okay. I gave him a shot for the pain. We'll need to get a stretcher to carry him up to medical. Ripley nods and picking up Newt proceeds Bishop down the aisle to the loading ramp. I had to circle the platform. It was becoming too unstable. I hope things didn't get too rough. Ripley turns to him, stopping partway down the ramp. She puts her hand on his shoulder. You did okay, Bishop. Well, thanks. I... Something bursts from his chest, spraying Ripley with milk-like android blood. It is the razor-sharp scorpion tail of the alien queen, driven right through him from behind. Bishop thrashes, seizing the protruding section of tail in his hands as it slowly lifts him off the deck. Above them, the queen glowers from its place of concealment among the hydraulic mechanisms inside one landing leg bay. Seizing Bishop in two great hands, it rips him apart and flings him aside, shredded like a doll. It descends slowly to the deck, the rotating lights glistening across its shiny black limbs, dripping acid and rage. Go, Newt. Run. Ripley moves with nightmarish slowness herself, staring hypnotized, terrified to break and run. Newt runs for cover. The alien drops to the deck, pivoting toward the motion. Ripley waves her arms, decoying. Here. Over here. Without warning, it moves like lightning, straight at her. Ripley spins, sprinting as the creature leaps for her. Its feet slam, echoing on the deck behind her. She clears a door, hits the switch. It whirs close. Boom. The alien hits a moment later. The queen turns his attention from the doors to Newt as the little girl crawls into a system of trench-like service channels which cross the deck. A section of grill is ripped away behind her. She scrambles desperately. Another section is ripped away right at her heels, light pouring in. The next will be right above her. The queen spins at the sound of door motors behind her. The parting doors reveal an inhuman silhouette standing there. Ripley steps out, wearing two tons of hardened steel, the power loader. Like medieval armor with the power of a bulldozer, she takes a step. The massive foot crash clangs to the deck. She takes another, advancing. Ripley's expression is one you hope you'll never see. Hell hath no fury like that of a mother protecting her child, and that primal, murderous rage surges through her now, banishing all fear. Get away from her, you bitch! A roundhouse from one great hydraulic arm catches it on its hideous skull and slams it into a wall. It rebounds into a massive backhand. Crash. It goes backward into heavy loading equipment. The queen emerges as a blur of rage, lashing with unbelievable fury. The battle is joined. Claws swipe. Tail lashes. Ripley parries with radical swipes of the steel forks. They circle in a whirling blur, demolishing everything in their path. The cavernous chamber echoes with nightmarish sounds. Whine. Crash, clang, screech. They lock in a death embrace. Ripley closes the forks, crushing two of the creature's limbs. It lashes and writhes with incredible fury, coming within inches of her exposed body. She lifts it off the ground. The hind legs rip at her, slamming against the safety cage, denting it in. They topple, off balance. The queen pins her. Ripley hits a switch. The power loader's cutting torch flares on, directly into the thing's face. They roll together over the lip of a rectangular pit, a vertical loading airlock. There is a hurricane shriek of air as the doors on which they are lying separate, revealing the infinite pit of stars below. Newt screams as the hurricane airstream sucks her across the floor toward the airlock. Bishop, torn virtually in two, his pasta-like internal organs whipped by the wind, grips a sanction and reaches desperately for Newt as she slides past him. He catches her arm and hangs on as she dangles, doll-like, in the air blast. With all her strength, Ripley fights the blasting air, crawling over the lip of the inner doorway. She releases the override from a second panel. The inner doors close. The turbulent air eddies and settles. Ripley crosses to Newt. Mommy. Mommy? Right here, baby. Right here. It's gone. Forever. They prepare for hypersleep to take the long journey home. Are we going to sleep? Newt asks. That's right. Are we going to dream? Yes, honey. I think we both can. Do you still promise that you won't leave me? Cross my heart and hope to die. The final lines here repeating the promise are not from the movie or the script. These final lines can only be seen in Newt's tale, though there are some narratory blocks that bring this comic to an end. The dream ends, and new ones follow. 
dreams of a past best forgotten, and of a future adventure destined never to take place. A grim ending, as we see the facehugger crawling on Newt's cryotube, knowing the fate that lies in store for her with Alien 3. The future adventure referred to here seems to be the comics themselves, and the suggestion here is that it was all in Newt's dreams. Alien's Newt's Tale was published in June and July 1992, right after Alien 3's theatrical release in May. It was released in two parts by Dark Horse Comics, and was also published serially in Aliens Magazine in the UK in six parts. And finally, it became available as a complete story in the form of a trade paperback. Today, it's also been made available from Marvel's recent release of Aliens, the original years, Omnibus Volume 1, and it can also be found digitally from Marvel, but only in its original two parts. It's a comic that stood the test of time, it's still a good story, and still a good adaptation. By following the script closer than the movie, I think it provides some nice insight into how James Cameron's script differs from the final film. I think the artwork is nice, the character likenesses are fair, but hardly spot on. Maybe it had something to do with the licensing of the actor's images, or maybe they wanted to make it just slightly cartoony. That way it could be recognized against the versions of the characters from the then-thriving Kenner toy line. Whatever the case, I think it followed the story of Aliens nicely, and for at least the portion that was adapted, it was done so faithfully. But I'd like to know how you feel about it. How does it work for you as an adaptation, or as a comic as a whole? Let me know your opinions on Newt's Tale in the comments below. And as always, I'd like to thank you very much for watching today. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to give it a like, and be sure to subscribe for all the latest videos from Alien Theory. A very special thanks goes out to Alisane, Grizz4756, Ronnie Jensen, and Xeno Shadowmorph, Queen Tears of the Patreon Hive. Thank you to Gregory Ford and John Griggs, the Hive's Praetorians. A very special thanks as always to Lady Anne in the Ellen Ripley Tier of Excellence. And in the role of Whaling Dutani Executives, Nashi FX, and Sergei Kalabashkin. If you'd like to join the Hive and support the channel, check out my Patreon page for exclusive posts and contests. In the meantime, you can catch up with Alien Theory over social media. Follow at Alien underscore Theory on Twitter and at Alien Theory YT on Facebook and Instagram for more. And until next time, this is Alien Theory, signing off.